The first thing to kind of always feel is that different moments in one's life, in one's relationship, need different tools and and uh, you know considerations. So, meaning, for instance, if you have a newborn, um, your uh, priority lay, lies somewhere very specific, right? Uh, but if you have, like, let's say, kids that are now going to school, but they still need you quite a bit, that's different, and so on and so on. So um, the first thing to determine is what is it that's, uh, that's actually doable? That's always number one, right? So there's often a gap between what you want and what's actually realistic. Correct. Correct, but that's for the two of you to decide. So let's just say I'm going to give you some hacks, right? And then you're going to go, okay, and then you come home, and then it turns out you don't have the hour it takes to do those hacks. You want a two-minute hack, right? So, so that's the first thing to consider is when is something possible? So um, when we work with couples, often um, you have to ask all these kind of questions. Do the kids get up when you do, or do they sleep in longer, right? Do they go to school and then you immediately need to run off, or do you have a few minutes? So those are some of the considerations where between the two of you, um, you have to determine when would be a good time to actually connect. Right. So let's just. So, so what are some of the, the the places where you potentially could? So at this point, at this point, you've been up for what 14, 16 hours or something yeah, like that. So that's a good consideration to have. So probably 16 hours into your work and parenting day, you're not going to hang off the rafters, swing off the rafters. Meaning, you know, you're not going to be that energetic and doing that much. So. If we take that into consideration and also take into consideration that you probably need a little bit of personal time, we're probably talking five minutes, ten minutes, that you have sustainably that you could spend together. So here are a few hacks, right? Mostly what happens when you uh, want to create closeness is you have to get from the different places you are at, your parent brain, your business brain, your need to pay the bills tomorrow, don't have milk brain, right? that kind of thing, to actual, actual maybe sexual or even just relational intimacy. So one of my favorite hacks um, that kind of transitions people is sit on the sofa, uh, not across, next to each other, but uh, you know, across from each other, so that each of you, if you have such a sofa or some place where you are sitting comfortably and you are in enough distance from each other that you can grab each other's feet. So is that possible? Okay, good. So and then what you do is you just sit and you have each other's feet in, in your laps or on your knees or whatever, and you start talking about the things you need to still talk about so that you, you can kind of slow down. Um, and that could be a catching up on something or something you're worried about. It could be anything. It doesn't have to be romantic. Uh, but what you do is you connect via touch. And so you're not just thinking, 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 you know, and, and talking at each other. You're actually engaging your body with each other, not in a sexual way, but also not in a casual, just rubbing on each other way. One of the deaths of sexual, uh, you know, excitement is when you're constantly touching all day, every day, because it actually desensitizes you to your partner's touch. And so there's a difference between conscious touch and casual just rubbing on each other. This would be a moment for conscious touch. You're going feet. And like Steve was doing this morning when he was saying, you rub and then you touch, right? The same is true. You take your hands, you feel your own hands, and you feel your partner's feet, let's say. And you engage sensually with each other while you wind down. Right? And if that's all you can do, that's still a really good hack, so to speak. Now, if you have a little bit more time, what you could do then is you could just be with each other and hang out, right? Just hang out and go transition from talking about the kids and who takes the dog to the vet to actually going, how are you? Or um, this is how I'm feeling, right? And maybe that's all there is to begin with. But over time, you'll notice that your body gets into the habit of connecting in that sensual way, 
and there'll be less of the brrr and more of the actually connecting in sensual ways. And then maybe you can work from your leg, from your feet to your leg and from your leg upwards, or you know, you can cuddle and then maybe you can kiss at some point or something like that. But that's not a must. And often the um, idea that you now must be intimate because it's the only 10 minutes you have is very counterproductive. So it's important to go, okay, well, maybe this is all we have time for right now. And prioritize that, the a conscious physical connection over the promise of you know, wild sex or whatever you think you should be having. And let your nervous system relax enough that that's a possibility. Right? Because it's not going to just happen spontaneously on the way to brush your teeth. Right? You're going to have to initiate it, but initiate it in a very non pressure away because there's already too much of that happening. And this is a good one. So that's one of my favorite hacks. <laughs> You're welcome. He also looks like he, ha he could use a good head rub ever so often. <laughs> right? That would, be, that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's my prescription. It's that. <laughs> yeah. And the other way too, right? Your ears. Her ears, your head. That would be another option. It's kind of a stealth way into other things when you don't put so much pressure on it. Then you have a chance of actually, like you were saying, you know, establishing some, some property there that you, you know, that's yours that you can access when you want to. So, yeah, thank you. Why do you think he should initiate instead of you? But why do you think he should, should it be a 50-50 thing? Or should he do it? Or what's the, what's your, what made you resentful? Well, here's, here's, an, here's one answer. This is not the only answer. I would have to ask you a lot of very personal questions. Like you said, there's layers to it. One thing gets to another. And in a relationship, you, some of you have heard me talk about this, in a relationship that lasts longer than a couple of years, there's, th there's three entities. Right? There's you, there's your partner, and there's the relationship. And the relationship becomes its own entity. And as its own entity, it has uh, layers of positive and negative habit patterns that have solidified. And so often when um, people here work together, you can see the third entity. And it's very, very apparent to somebody who knows what they're looking for, what's happening based on that third entity, to, so to speak. So it's a, comp it's a more complicated question. But one of the answers is, in a good functioning relationship, whoever is good at something should do it. It's an unfortunate truth. But if you're really good at initiating, and you can have the beat on when it's important that the two of you connect, then you should just do that. You know, there's these ideas that men do certain things or women do certain things, or even worse, some people call feminine, say feminine but mean women, or they don't mean women, but then it's interpreted as women. So there's a lot of weird model stuff. The, the key rule is um, whoever is good at something should do it. That's the contribution to the relationship. Right. regardless of gender roles, which are outdated by now. Now, you might have sexual preferences, meaning in the sexual occasion, you might want to be the one taken somewhere. So you're the follower. We did leading and following, right? Um, and in the sexual occasion, you might want to be the one taking somewhere, so the leader. But that's not always true. You might be super tired one day, and then you want her to lead. But there's a general... Um, preference. But in life, uh, that's not really applicable, right? Otherwise, we're back in the 50s, where you wait at the door with a little casserole, right? <laughs> and he's come home from slaying the dragon, and he you know, can barely talk because he's so in his mind about his things, right? And you're like, ah! You know, I mean, who wants that? There's kind of a neo-tantric movement towards re-engineering that which is not exactly useful. You know? But for instance, um, uh, you know, I, I know a couple where her father was a very famous race car driver. 
and she, know, she can fix anything mechanical. While he is a writer and the, the kind of guy who would never even know what to do with a screwdriver. Right? And they had an entire thing that almost killed their relationship where she somehow thought because he's the man, he should fix the lawnmower or the car or the whatever, the kids stuff, which is insane because it was essentially her expertise. Right? While he could do other things really well. And so it's a matter of essentially going beyond what you think should happen. Now you can discuss how can you feel more desired by him, because that's the real issue. The real issue is not uh, should he initiate, initiate the occasion. It's that somehow you don't feel that he's as much into you as you would like him to be. right? But that's independent from who initiates. Maybe you just really know when is the right time, and then he can enjoy that, and then he shows his appreciation, which is probably the way it goes, right? Yes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so everything before that is a construct that can, you know, can cause enormous amount of discontent. And sometimes in a relationship, which is not what's usually done, but somebody was saying, where are you? Uh, the two of them over there were telling me they're about to get married in a month uh, over here. And um, yes, and they're doing kind of premarital counseling, so to speak, in the form of some therapy, um, so that they're actually figuring out how to give to each other, right? And we don't usually do that. You know, in the olden days, the priest did it, which was really, you know, quite good because they have so much experience in relationship. <laughs> but, uh, but at least somebody pointed at things and says, have you ever thought about, are the kids going to get baptized or who's going to make the money? Right? At least they did that. But we kind of go in uh, not having agreed on the purpose of the relationship. Um, or we had a purpose of relationship and then it changes. You know, often we get to see people and they're like, well, you know, we had fun and now we have a child and now it's not fun anymore. And it's like, well, have you actually renegotiated the relationship? No. So, you know, if you get together and you just want to have sex and travel the world and suddenly one wants a child, the other one gets kind of into that but didn't actually agree to the change of purpose, all kinds of weird things happen. So I think uh, it's important occasionally in a long-term relationship to sit down and get back on the same page on what's the actual purpose of the relationship. And reimagine it a little bit. Yeah. It's like having a house. You can decorate it however you want. You want to paint all the walls black. I like, just did that. I'm <laughs> thinking about Michaela, because Michaela's house burned down and now she's got a new house, and she painted the living room and kitchen black, much to the consternation of the architect. And the contractor, and the painter. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone else who knows me. <laughs> yeah. Why not? It's her house. It's my house. It's your relationship, you know. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the things when you can, uh, you get to make it together. What works, you know, tailor-made for you too. Yeah. And so along the lines of what we did a bit earlier, it's a good thing to sit and say, what are you really good at, right? And each person go, well, I think I'm really good at this, but I don't want to do it, right? And the other person goes, well, I'm really good at this too, I'll do it. Or they say, I really suck at this, so you're going to have to do it, right? So you kind of go through some of the things that are really important to you and restate what you're good at and what you want to do. And that takes a lot of the resentment. It takes the bite out of the resentment because you have renegotiated. Even though there might be the same terms, right? you have renegotiated the terms and it clarifies things. And then if it no longer works, well, then you renegotiate. That's one of the, this is another one of those hacks, by the way, right? How do you keep it uh, interesting? You ever so often uh, restate and renegotiate the terms so that it feels fresh. The first thing that you always have to do in any situation is you need to be able to train your attentional skill enough that you can actually be with someone. 
right? That's really important. And it's not true that the, the more masculine partner, doesn't matter if it's men or women, right, um, has to be present and the more feminine partner doesn't have to. If you're not with each other, you're not with each other, right? And there's no actual intimacy if uh, two people are not there. So first you train attentional skill. Then you create resonance, and one of the ways you create resonance is by actually acknowledging and praising and connecting through the heart. Another way to create resonance is by what Steve, what on one of the things that Steve taught in the morning, which is bringing your bodies into connection. But then the next things he does, and you can talk about that, were all about polarity and how to reliably create polarity. So I'll let you. The foundation of physical understanding between two people. You can come together with all the best will in the world, but if the bodies aren't somewhat on the same wavelength, it's kind of jerky and doesn't work, right? So the first thing you have to be able to feel is, are the bodies tuned? But how do we do that? Well, leading and following is a great way of doing it. The leading and following itself is beginning to create a certain kind of polarity between the leader and the follower. You're taking different roles for the sake of going somewhere. If you both try to lead, it doesn't work. If you both try to follow, it's like two jellyfish, isn't it? So you need to have, or one of the, one of the uh, practical tips in terms of leading and following, in terms of polarity, is to experiment with leading and following deliberately, almost you could say artificially, and by that I mean not necessarily spontaneously, one of you leads and the other follows. So you could decide that for tonight, you know, you're in charge, or for tonight your partner's in charge, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course it doesn't mean you can't say, no, I don't like it, or, you know, stop, or of course you can do all those things, right? But fundamentally one of you leads and the other follows. And then you have other things to play with, expansion and contraction also. So you're leading, where are you going to take them? So very well and good to say leading and following, but sometimes it helps to have a sense of, well, where, what are the sorts of places I might say I'm leading? I want to take somebody. Well, you can then apply the flavor, the, the flavor of expansion and contraction. Okay, I'm going to, let's have an expansive afternoon. You know. Maybe there's a bubble bath, jacuzzi, <laughs> eye contact, gauze, strawberries, <laughs> sensual massage or something like this, right? Or you might think, okay, I'm going to, let's be more contractive this time. So the leading takes a more, if you want, slightly demanding or domineering flavor to it. Once again, within the context of two people who are you know, consensually engaged in that, of course. And then it can be a little bit more directed, you could say. A little bit more restrictive. Mm -hmm. A little bit more... And that can create quite a lot of hotness. But the problem is when you've been in a relationship for so long, in a sense that you know each other's tricks, you know each other's rhythms, that's why it's sometimes helpful to almost, like playing dress up in a way, you almost, for the fun of it, to see what happens, you take those different poles, leading, following, expansion or contraction. There's others, there's a sum. You know, and you say, let's play with it, let's try it. Because it's a bit like physics in a way. It's a bit like, it, it seems to work very often, even if you don't know the person, even if you don't like the person, you can begin to feel a little bit of something, a charge. Um, so that's the, that charge, that is the beginning of the possibility of polarity. You can also, and this goes back to what we were saying earlier, you can also uh, create a situation that's different than usual. So one of the ways you can create difference, and this is a very quick one, is don't touch for, let's say, six hours. Particularly those of you who touch all the time, right? Because like I said, touching is kind of rubbing off the polarity and it's very lovey-dovey, but it's not exactly uh, making the body want to be touched, you know? So, so you could play with something like, okay, we're not actually going to touch other than it's an accidental brushing or something. Or we're not actually going to spend the entire afternoon sitting next to each other on our laptops, uh, you know, like just casually ever so often brushing up. But we're going to be in different rooms doing different things. And then at the appointed time, whatever that is, dinner or you're going out, will come back together after not having done the habitual thing. And sometimes it just takes 
uh, an hour or two, or maybe a day, you know, where you can completely resensitize to your partner's touch or to your partner's kiss or whatever you're playing with by not having randomly done it in the habitual ways. And different people do different things. For some people, they might not touch all day, um, and so they're, they're kind of alienated and they need a little bit more touch. But for other people, it's not constantly rubbing on each other, right? So you have to find the things that make you different. Another one that's uh, really, really important in long-term relationships is that you have separate interests. I can't say enough about that, right? I, I know it's hotly disputed sometimes. I got into a lot of um, strange... English press about this um, because I was quoted as one of my as one of my clients quoted me as having said it was okay for them to live in separate houses and all hell broke loose all over Europe how dare I and how could I and what weird Hollywood shit is this and so on and so on right and so um, I've talked about this recently a lot but it really really works is to take time apart. Now, not everybody wants to or can live in separate houses. You don't have to. You don't even have to have separate bedrooms, but you have to do things by yourself so you're actually still interesting. Right? So for common, yes, right? Because talking about the milk and the dog and gas bills is not sexy. It's never sexy. It has never been sexy. And you never did it when it was still exciting, right? Because... When you think about what made a date exciting, that's still true. So, so what do people do when they first meet and go on a date? They come from separate places, and they usually take a little bit of time to prepare for the date. Right? You don't have to go through the whole waxing and hair blowing out thing necessarily. but Brush your you teeth. Brush at least. your teeth at least. <laughs> Put different clothes on, right? Uh, so you prepare separately. You come together at an appointed time for the sole purpose of enjoying each other. Now, that goes out the window. You don't meet on the sofa, right, in, in your sweatpants. Brush. Date night becomes, now I've got you here. Yeah. Uh, you know, we need to pay this bill and do this and so on and so exactly. forth. You know, it's like a good time for a meeting. You know? yeah. So you do the things you used to do on a date. Prepare separately, spend some time apart, come together with a purpose, uh, dress a bit differently, have interesting things to say. When you first meet somebody, you're like, oh, and then I read this article, let me tell you about, and the other person's like, oh, really? And they're like, oh, he's so intelligent. And then later, you're just talking about the gas bill, right? So that's how you create polarity on a very practical level. Uh, last thing I want to say about that is... Um, I sometimes call this date night discipline, right? And what that is, is that when you meet, it doesn't have to be going out, but when you meet with the distinct idea of spending intimate time together, maybe not even sex, but just the two of you, you are not allowed to speak about the kids, the animals, the bills, the office, the babysitter, or anything else, right? And you shouldn't have your phone on unless you're an emergency surgeon, in which case you shouldn't have a date on the day you are on call, right? <laughs> so, so that's really, really, really important. You can't expect, because when you first dated, nobody checked their you know, Twitter every 20 seconds. Um, you actually spend time with each other. And it was funny, the other day somebody interviewed me and they were saying, this was a, a woman who had a podcast about for young parents, and she was saying, well, the women are always saying uh, the only, you know, the guys want sex and they don't want the sex. And I said to her, well, here's one of the reasons why. They're not just some crazy brutes who want sex regardless of how tired they are, the women are. It's the only time where there isn't a phone, where there isn't... Uh, screaming kids, where the door gets locked, where it's just the two people in a room with each other, not doing all the other shit that life entails, right? And that is why sex has such value. It's not the sex itself, right? That's nice enough and everything. It's the concerted effort of two people being with each other in a way that's different than the usual. And if you can do that, there's a high chance things will load back up when you so choose. Well, it's a very individual thing for, you know, I, I can't tell you a blueprint 
Um, I've developed these exercises over many years in many iterations and never teach them quite the same because it depends on what the group can do, right? And how, you know, what the, what the temperature is like and how many people are coming and going. There's all kinds of factors that um, influence how an exercise is done. But here's some guidelines on, on if you want to do things at home. This is true for even sexual practice and stuff like that, right? So when you want to do something at home, you're going to run into a few um, roadblocks. <laughs> One of which is that it's very easy to fall into the pattern of the other person thinking there's something wrong, right? which immediately stops the thing. Um, and whoever is initiating the situation is going to have to consider that the person uh, that, that you want to have this conversation with might not be in that particular mindset at this particular moment. So it, what I mean by that is it can't be done spontaneously. And under no circumstances can it be done if you are doing self-prescribed um, practice. It can never be done when the thing is up, whatever the thing is, right? So meaning you've just had a, 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 a the, the, the thing, whatever the thing is, has just flared up and you're like, all right, let's break it down, right? That's not going to work, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and that, that, would be, that would be the, the, you know, the, the thing that you want to do. So what you could do is you could say once a week, let's say, or once a month, depending on how much time you have, you sit down and it has to have a beginning and an end. This is really important. So you say, okay, from 3.30 to 4.30, you're going to break something down. And then another nice thing about that would be you take turns. So in January, it's your turn. In February, it's his turn, right? And you go, okay. So this is something that I think we should look under the hood of this particular thing, right? And you do it when it's not up, and one of you kind of goes, okay, this is what's happening, and then you see if you can break it down. So things to do when you break it down, and this is also true if you want to do sexual practice, you've decided you want to become great you know, tantric masters and whatever, right? Or you just want to have regular sex. You, and you make a time, right? This is always a bit, okay, and now what? So somebody has to lead, somebody follows. Whoever leads knows where they want it to go. Doesn't mean it goes there, but somebody has to be holding the thing and somebody goes along with it, right? And then what you do is you kind of look at what's happening and what would you like to happen, right? And then you go, why is it not happening? And then you, uh, then you both ask yourself the questions, uh, you know, and you slice it. It's like, um, I, did, I learned how to do autopsy when I was in my early 20s. And one of the things that you do, you, take, you get a whole body at the beginning of the year and you take off layer after layer after layer after layer of the entire human, so to speak, till you're down to the bare bones. And it's, it's like that. You slice it as fine as you can and you look at each layer. Right? And maybe in the beginning you can't slice that fine, but over time you get a sense of really, really slicing fine. You know? And then um, you have to be creative with how you handle that. And so that's the best general thing I can give you. This is, of course, you know, um, highly individual. The first thing is to acknowledge that that is an inevitability, I think. If you are getting the groove of Kicking ass and taking names is the phrase, I believe. That's a groove you get into. That's a, that's a rhythm. It's not a groove and a rhythm that's conducive necessarily to socializing or connecting or relaxing. Regardless of the, the polarity issue, if you're a, a sort of person who is one of those kick ass, take name people, then one thing that's very good is to, to have some sort of buffer in between the kicking ass and taking names, or if you're a surgeon, whatever, you know, cutting out the hearts of your patients and you know, <laughs> holding them aloft and I don't know, what, you know drinking from that. No, that's, that's not a that's, surgeon. No, that's What's not that a again? Surgeon. Witch. Witch. <laughs> Witch, yeah. 
and the being, you know, back to like normal human being again, you have to have some kind of a buffer. My, my father, who had a kick ass and take names later kind of job, um, and my mother had, this is a bit different because my mother was stay at home, but we'll, we'll apply this to, you know, the, the, the surgeon and the other person coming home. But so my parents had, and they're still married 50 something years into it, and they're still kind of sexually alive in their relationship, even though they're in their late 70s. They still have that, you know, that, that little bit, and I come upon them in the kitchen ever so often kissing, which uh, is quite interesting, right, when I come visit at home. So they still have that thing going on. And one of the ways they did that is they had an ironclad rule that when my father would come home, he got um, time away before he had to re-engage with the family. Even though she was at home having, you know, my, and, um, my sister and I were not, uh, you know, Those docile are. children <laughs> by any means, right? So, so my mother had spent all day with two girls who were bouncing, uh, uh, you know, around the house. Uh, but there was this understanding that because he came from somewhere and she had been doing something. There had to be a buffer before the next thing happened. And so they had this very well-established routine where um, my dad would come home, he'd greet us, and he'd go into the bedroom. Now, mind you, this was pre-internet and stuff like that. Um, and he was to be left alone. We weren't allowed to go in there. My mom kept us somewhat busy. Later, you know, there was TV. When, but when we were little, that my parents didn't let us watch TV. But she'd spend some more time with them. She'd go in there. She'd catch them up, usually on my bad math grades. I was horrendous at math. And then I was summoned later, right? But he got to have the time. And what that did was it gave them both a moment to... Um, re-engineer how they related with each other without the things clashing, right? Because often it's the, you know, in the somebody staying home, somebody going to work, it's, I've been with the kids all day, I need to talk with an adult, right? That, that kind of, you take over, I need a moment. And then, of course, the other person goes, I've just kicked ass and taken names all day. I need, you know, I need to kind of lick my wounds from the battlefield before I can re-engage with the enemy, so to speak, right? <laughs> so that's one option. The other option with two very kick-ass people in the house is you get together and you both bark orders, right? And you expect the other one to fall into place, which is also not an option. So you have to pull apart and, and, you, and have to step down, right? You just have to step down. How that's done, I don't know. I have lots of clients, and so do you, who both have massive careers, and they have children, and they have a babysitter, and they want to relieve the babysitter. The babysitter can wait another 20 minutes, right? Your children can wait another 20 minutes, because they also get barked at in, you know, in that general kind of way. So you step away, and you step apart, and you step down, however you do that. That's different for different people. And only then do you re-engage. It doesn't need to be a particularly long time either, so long as it's regular. The thing about regularity is that it has a, a sort of compounding effect. If you do something regularly, it has a compounding effect. If you take 20 minutes to step down, you know, Monday, this Monday, let's say, you're not going to be able to necessarily step down all the way. But if it's every day, or at least most days, then when you're going, it's sort of like a ritual. It triggers in a certain sense, so it, it makes it easier. And something else that can, you know, that can be done, it's a very delicate thing, is to, ha to, to have some kind of understanding between the two of you that it's an inevitability. It's the price you pay for being in a kick-ass, taking aim sort of situation. So it's not a flaw or something like that. You, you have your buffer there. But if it's happening, if you're, if you're coming, and it's like this, and there's no option, it's fight or back down. And backing down isn't going to work either. Because if you keep backing down all the time, that's setting a bad precedent. It's not going to go anywhere either. So it's not going to work. You have to be able to call some sort of a ceasefire. You know, some kind of a ceasefire. You're doing, you're in kick-ass, take name mode. This is going nowhere. And you can't play that card whenever the person's being annoying. It doesn't work. You know, you have to have a bit of trust, right? But if you can say that to the person, and they'll say, I don't think I am. I think you just need to do what I'm telling you to do. However... <laughs> Previously, in a sober state of mind, we agreed this can happen sometimes. So I'm going to take your word for it as an experiment. But if you're fucking with me, you know, 
it's not going to work again in the future. It's something like this, right? You kind of give each other a little bit, the benefit of the doubt, step away, you know, take a deep breath, come back again. It takes a person of substance or a couple of substance to navigate something like that. Fortitude, probably. Both yeah. parties. Yeah. yeah, it takes a certain thing. So there's, I think, uh, if you can pull that off, then a lot of respect to you. Just respect, trust, communication, mm -hmm. and some good rituals can mitigate that, mm -hmm. uh, I'd say. I want to just add one thing as a kicker of asses and a taker of name my, names myself, right? It's an addiction. And what I mean with that, I'm not meaning an actual classical addiction, but something in a brain, particularly in a woman's brain, there's a reason for that, which I can explain to you. Um, actually, why don't I explain it to you? I'm assuming you would like me to explain it to you. So one of the things that happens in a woman's body, and this is not sexual orientation, this is plumbing, right? We're talking female hormones, uh, female body parts. Um, because we are built primarily for survival, right? First and foremost, we're supposed to bring more of the species forward. And so uh, we have specific um, organs and, and hormone chains that make that so. So when you have a woman's body, regardless if you procreate or not, you need a lot of energy down here because everything happens down here. <laughs> Ovulation, pregnancy, cycles, a lot of feeling there, intuition, power, right? This is kind of the power center. And so when you do a lot of kick-ass work, what you're doing mostly is you're thinking and giving commands. And so the energy has, and there's only so much energy in a human body, right? You know that. There's 440 megahertz, I think, output on the cortex of the brain per second. You can't upgrade the RAM. You know, people have tried. So that's what you have available. It has to go somewhere. So if you're not using it down here because you're sitting on a desk, let's say, but you need a lot here because you're speaking and writing and talking and answering emails, everything gets pulled up and it tightens and it goes in the head. That's why women particularly suffer from tight neck and shoulders, head, yeah, she's pointing to all the places, headaches, TMJ, you name it. It's the mechanics of the energy, the vast energy that sits in a pelvic bowl being squeezed up into this area where it's being used. Once it's up there, it doesn't come down that easily. And so that's what I mean with addictive. You get into this loop where you're just doing the thing, right? And it's all up here. And one of my most horrible stories about this is that I once had like a thousand something emails after having taught a five day or so. I get lots of emails. And I had to do emails, so I, and it was like a matter of I could only do it that day. So I spent from 5 in the morning till midnight doing emails. And then my inbox was empty. And I remember distinctly, I took a photo of the empty inbox and I sent it to Steve, who was in England, to say, I have finally mastered the inbox. And guess what happened then? Emailed you? That would uh, well, that would have been funny. <laughs> no, I didn't. That's the sort of thing I would. Do. I didn't get up. I didn't get up and go. I spent an enormous amount of time. I'm now gonna go and have a bath and dance and have a cup of tea and go to bed. No, I went like. And I waited for the first email to come in, and then I answered it. And then I waited for the next one, and then the next one. And I was totally obsessed with keeping the inbox empty till I realized what the hell I was doing, right? It's that addictive. So when she comes home and she's in that mode, um, it's not that she doesn't have self-responsibility around that, but it's a bit rough to get out of that. And so the hack here, since we're always about hacks these days, is to come back into the body, come back down here. So this where, once again, comes the thing that I told these two comes in. You touch somebody's feet. You touch their thighs. You move with their body in ways where the energy has to come down. Hip circles are optimal. Squats are optimal. Going for a walk, optimal, right? Um, rolling around on the floor with the kids or the dog, or just rolling her around on the floor, you know, um, if she's up for such things, brings the energy back down. Once the energy is back down, the body goes, ah, and then you're suddenly, she's taking a deep breath just by me describing it. 
<laughs> because your physiology wants that, but once it's pooled, it's pooled. So there's many creative ways that you can get the energy down, and all of them have to do with movement and touch. <laughs>